Brady, right? Right. So can you tell us about working at the Pioneer Memorial? I came in 1973, which was the last uh, year and a half of the Old Dixie Pioneer Memorial Hospital. Uh, it was a great hospital. I had trained at a large UCLA hospital. Coming to that was obviously a great change. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm going to have you start again because the audio was a little bit off. So if you just start that again for me. Okay. And also start with, like, who are you and what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. Could you introduce yourself first? <laughs> yes, I'm Dr. Craig Booth. Uh, I grew up here in St. George. I uh, went to school at Dixie College, uh, University of Utah. Finished some training at UCLA before I came back here in 1973 in family practice. Uh, I loved the old Dixie Pioneer Memorial Hospital. Uh, I had trained at UCLA, so it was a huge hospital, and moved back here in a one hall hospital. You could stand in the emergency room and scream at the nurses down in OB, and they could hear you and do the things that you uh, needed done. We didn't have to have an intercom system, uh, we were our own system. Uh, that hospital obviously didn't have very many modern things. I remember bringing the first chest tube here, the first blood gas machine, uh, things which we all take for granted today, but uh, it still met the needs. Uh, that hospital lived basically on the freeway, not the freeway, but the old Highway 91 as it went over Utah Hill. The accidents kept that hospital open, but uh, we gradually brought on a number of specialists and got too big and uh, moved into this portion of what we called the new hospital in those days here on 400 East. So, I, I heard you step out real quick while he's asking this and put a note on the door so somebody don't try to open it down there. You can also watch for the next video. Um, I'll, I'll so open it when he gets the next question. I heard that the, it was kind of hot in that hospital. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like, there was no air conditioning. You know, we had uh, uh, what do you call them, swamp coolers, uh, and it did get very warm there in the summertime. Uh, so we avoided being there as much as possible. Uh, <clears throat> one of the main reasons we moved out of that hospital, not only because it was becoming old, was for that very reason. We needed air conditioning. And that was built in 1949 or 1950 before we had air conditioning. So that was a major issue. But there were a lot of other, other problems with the hospital. We only had a one bed uh, emergency room. Uh, we had a one bed delivery suite, basically. Uh, so it needed to expand into a lot of things. The lab was very cramped, uh, any number of things. We just outgrew it all. So what was trauma care like? Trauma care was scary, uh, simply because uh, none of us were general surgeons. Uh, one of the most scary cases I ever remember was at Christmas time. It was about this time, an older gentleman, uh, in those days I thought he was really old, he was probably 65 or 70, uh, fell on, an ele on a, a ladder in the senior citizen center putting up Christmas decorations. He fell down and the rungs of the ladder came across his abdomen and chest and lacerated his liver and his bowel and, and uh, a large blood vessel in his abdomen and it just began to fill with blood and we had to take him to the operating room and all of us had had some surgical training but that's that's major surgical uh, procedure and luckily uh, he survived us we were able to fix everything and he did well lived another 10 to 15 years and and uh, donated liberally to the hospital after we had done that uh, kind of surgery for him. Uh, the other trauma that we had though was orthopedic trauma and it was nice to finally have an orthopedic surgeon who would come and take care of that. Uh, that was the major first need that we had in terms of patient care beyond the family docs. But before that the family docs just had to take care of it just like uh, Dr. Kiley and the rest of the crew on TV. The uh, county commissioners owned the hospital, or the county owned the hospital. 
county commissioners basically were in charge of the hospital and they they were under the gun to spend a lot of money for a big new hospital. We didn't have a hundred thousand people here at that time and so that was a major undertaking on their part to build this unit and this this unit that we're in right now cost uh, five million dollars which was a fortune in those days. It's pocket change today but uh, the county commissioner stepped forward and began to build the hospital. We each uh, gave our input and the architects uh, built around it and fulfilled our needs. We needed increased operating room, increased delivery time, uh, we needed more medical beds and they they took care of each need as we had at that time. The real problem is no one could foretell what the growth was going to be in our county and it exploded and so we built this hospital for 30, 40,000 people and before we knew it, there were 50, 60,000 people in the county, plus a large draw area. In those days, we drew a lot of people out of Las Vegas to have their babies here because it was so much cheaper. And a lot of people would grow up here and move to Las Vegas and would come back to, to their family docks and have their deliveries done. So the hospital, we outgrew this hospital in just a very short time. But it was a great hospital uh, physically compared to the other. Uh, it was still small enough that there was a small medical staff. We all knew each other. It was very collegial. Uh, we enjoyed it. Uh, it. met our needs for quite a while, but uh, we quickly understood that probably for the next 400 years there would never be a time at Dixie when we weren't building something. So, I know that they, they added that, that new patient tower in the 80s. Tell us a little bit about how it expanded. Right. Well, he damn producer sure really screwed things up. <laughs> we moved into here in 1975, and it became very evident very quickly that we we hadn't built enough hospital. And right at that same time, uh, the county sold the hospital to IHC. So IEC brought in their planning people and it became obvious and we were able to show by our production and future production that we were going to need a lot more, uh, a lot more beds, a lot more room in almost every area. It was just a duplicate and it always is a duplicate of services. So we designed the North Tower that we have here. Uh, we designed that with a fifth floor which was shelled in. Uh, that was enough for about 34 beds. But at the time we built that, all of a sudden in American medicine, everything shifted from inpatient to outpatient. So that fifth floor stayed unused for almost eight years. Uh, we thought we'd have to fill it in within a year or two for additional beds, but because of the shift to outpatient, when I moved here in 73, if you had a hemorrhoid surgery or a hernia surgery, we'd bring you in the night before, get you all prepped up, shave you, do all the things, and then do the surgery the next day and keep you two or three days. Uh, today, none of that is, is inpatient, it's all outpatient. So we had to shift quickly, not only to a few additional beds, but increased outpatient services, which was the big push for the new tower. Um, I forgot to mention, can you try to say Intermountain Healthcare instead of IHC? <laughs> yeah, try. As we go forward. Um, can you talk about about when we were growing out of this, this building and this time going over the road? It became obvious in the early 90s, particularly in the operating room, that we were just not big enough here, that we were going to need uh, an additional hospital. And we, through planning, understood now that it, was got, that it would have to be a campus not just a building. Our, our thinking changed that we needed to go to a full outpatient array of services as well as some inpatient services. So we looked around the community. Uh, we found a great family, the Foremaster family, who are willing to donate part and, and sell part of the 50 acres east of us. And we went to them, worked out uh, all of the things that go along with that, and secured that 50 acres, added a few more acres a little later, and then brought in a national firm uh, who, who did planning and uh, pre-construction. And we, 
we basically designed the entire site rather than just one building. We had to build one building to meet all the needs of uh, expansion of services in this particular facility. But we thought at that time, this is a great time, uh, we're built here on eight acres. We thought it's time to take us to 50 acres plus and design the entire campus uh, to meet our needs hopefully into the next uh, 50 to 100 years. It's very difficult to do. Uh, most hospitals in our country are all all squeezed into a very small area including most of the major teaching hospitals. We had an opportunity to just do it all and uh, it was fun. Um, can you talk about, about the community helping, helping support that project? You know, clear from when I came, uh, the year I came, the Pink Ladies, that's what they were called, became a volunteer group at the old Dixie Pioneer Memorial. And that has just grown and expanded. And then there are many programs, particularly the Jubilee of Trees, where community members by the hundreds could come in and not only, not only contribute money, but contribute services. Uh, there are a lot of valuable things done by our volunteers. They, they replace four or five full-time workers in our hospital. Not any one individual, but their total contribution of hours would, would replace four or five or six uh, full-time employees that would have to be paid. Uh, they enjoy it, uh, gives us a chance to get to know community members, uh, it inspires other community members. We're a bit of a retirement community and those people are looking for things to do. Uh, one of the worst things we ever see is people who retire here who have nothing to do and they get depressed and they worry about their blood pressure and worry about everything else and we're able to provide uh, volunteer services where they can come in, do a valuable service, feel needed, feel wanted, and feel valuable. Uh, what more can you ask for in life? Um, let's go back. Can you talk a little bit more about how about Intermountain Healthcare buying the hospital back in '75? Can you talk a little bit about that? Intermountain Healthcare, not AMC. Okay, I came in 1973, and Intermountain became Intermountain Healthcare in 1975, and we were their first purchase. After they organized and became an entity, they came and talked about either renting our hospital, uh, but in, in the negotiation it became obvious that they should buy us. And they bought us from the county. Became a great deal for the county, became a good deal for Intermountain Healthcare, and it became a tremendous deal for us because Intermountain Healthcare had both the expertise and the money to help us expand and, and stay ahead of the expansion of our community. I think uh, my experience with politics in our state is they have continually underestimated the growth of most of the state, but particularly of southern Utah. And Intermountain Healthcare was smart enough to realize this place is exploding. And it did explode. There were probably 15 to 20,000 people here when I came back as a physician. There were six physicians at that, in that, at that time. Uh, there's 262 full-time docs now, and Intermountain Healthcare has helped us expand the services, not only to fit the need of the community, but to bring in all the specialty services that are necessary for the community, and provide opportunities for, for some very uh, capable and sometimes brilliant docs. Let me go out here real quick, someone keeps trying to get in. I think Just lock the door. Mitigate. I think this is the last question. I just want to think of, of, of your most memorable experience from, from working here. I think just six with you, that was great. Um, I'm going to retell that story of that guy because that probably is as memorable as anything. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, you just have to replay it. There are a lot of great experiences that have occurred uh, during the uh, 40 years that I've been here. But I think the most memorable occurred uh, in the first two years when an older gentleman fell at the Senior Citizen Center. A ladder fell with him on it, putting up Christmas decorations, and the rungs of the ladder came across his chest and a couple came across his abdomen. He was probably 80, 83 years old, and the trauma of these rungs lacerated his liver, his intestine, 
and a couple of the major blood vessels in his abdomen. And you could just see his abdomen expanding as we were looking at him and he was slipping into shock. And my partners and I, all three of us family docs, but with some surgical training, had to take him to the operating room and repair the liver laceration, repair the intestine, repair the artery. Uh, we sweat blood. We probably sweat more blood than he lost, but uh, we were able, and you know, we didn't know if we could save him or not, but we were the only chance he had. And he survived it, lived another 10 or 15 years, became a volunteer at our hospital, uh, did a great job. I can't think of another uh, instance that stands out in my mind as clearly as that one, and it was more than 30 years ago. And then meeting her, too, has been probably one of the finer uh, experiences of my life. Yeah. Is that it? I took a shower just for that. <laughs> Who's coming in? Thank you so much. It was very good to meet you. Like you're really uh, active in that. Thank you.